Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, February 8th, 2017 edition of the Sand Center Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. In order to make a password difficult to crack, there are kind of two options. You can make it very diverse, meaning lots of different types of letters, numbers, special symbols, and you can also make it long. Now, one way to possibly increase the diversity of letters that you're using is by including emojis or other Unicode characters in your password. In the past, this has been quite difficult because keyboards don't provide easy access to these characters but that has been changing a lot of mobile devices in particular the touch screen ones make it pretty easy to type emojis or include them in your keyboard also of course now some of the more recent apple laptops have uh, this special touch bar which can be used to type emojis so why not use them for a password i was playing around a little bit with this today and it actually looks like it's possible a little bit critical here that you're hashing your data before you're inserting it into the database. Then the database no longer matters really. Otherwise, it's really kind of difficult to get all the character sets lined up between database and web front end. You often see this and we still have problems with this on our site sometimes where certain foreign characters or so don't show up correctly on the site. So if you have been successful with this, either in creating a site that does allow emojis for passwords, or if you have used them on a site yourself, I would be interested in to hear if you are willing to share your experience. And then a correction I forgot yesterday on Monday, I think it was, I talked about the timer, the clock signaling issue in Meraki equipment. Well, it's actually not the access points, it's the switches and the security appliance that is affected by this problem. And uh, apparently they'll fail after 18 months in operation. With the beginning of this year, iOS applications were supposed to take advantage of TLS in order to be approved for the App Store. Now in December, Apple did extend the deadline. It didn't come up with a new deadline yet. In this light, it's kind of interesting to see Verifyly, to look at some popular applications and see how they are dealing with TLS and connections. They found 76 popular popular applications and these are applications that are estimated to be downloaded several million times that do not implement TLS for some of their connections or do not implement it correctly. Even if a developer does use app transport security, that's how Apple calls the feature that implements TLS. There are still many configuration options that are really up to the application. For example, how the certificate is validated and the developer may still choose to accept unverified certificates, which of course in many cases does invalidate the protection that TLS provides. Now, Verifyly did not just consider all unencrypted connections as a severe problem. They did apply a little bit of more created approach in that, for example, data that's really just used for application tracking, ads and the like, is not considered to be as severe as personal data that may be leaked, but there were still a number of applications that did leak or potentially leak personal data. As an end user, there isn't of course much you can do about this other than trying to avoid public Wi-Fi networks or try to use a VPN. But of course, that will only protect part of the connection, won't protect the connection end-to-end -end as TLS is attempting to do. And starting with Google Chrome 56, Chrome now has the ability to connect directly to Bluetooth devices. This standard has been called a web Bluetooth and of course it's in line with the overall intent of Chrome to somewhat replace the operating system and include more and more direct access to hardware components like Bluetooth. There is also something in the works about direct access to USB. Now, problem here is uh, what new security implications do you get uh, if you allow the browser to connect to Bluetooth devices? 
To respond to these concern, a member of the Chrome team published an extensive blog post detailing the security model, how this was implemented and why they believe this to be secure. They did, for example, some extensive fuzzing on the APIs and kept the APIs relatively small to kind of keep the attack surface small here. Also, users have to explicitly allow access to Bluetooth devices, similar to what you typically see, for example, with GPS access and the like. But if you have some concerns, uh, read the blog article. It goes in a lot more detail than what I can cover here in this podcast. And Gmail apparently still can be tricked into accepting email claiming to come from gmail.com, even though it comes from a mail server not associated with Gmail. Now, Gmail has done a lot of work uh, with SPF, uh, DKIM, also implemented DMARC and the like in order to make this as difficult as possible. But apparently it's still possible to spoof an email from gmail.com and have it received by a Gmail user. The basic trick being applied here is to use a different from address in the email envelope than to use in the actual from header. Uh, This is a fairly standard uh, old trick kind of interesting that it still works for Gmail, but the problem is likely that often the email header is legitimately different from the envelope, and that's probably why Gmail doesn't filter these emails. Renato Marino wrote a pretty lengthy article about this uh, with lots of screenshots and samples, so you can also check your own mail server if it's vulnerable to this kind of attack. Apparently, Yahoo is not vulnerable to this. Well, that's it for today, so thanks again for listening, and talk to you again tomorrow.